now we should be able to, to start the webinar. Welcome everybody to our first space and security webinar. I hope you all hear me. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Uh, for those of you who just not know us, we are a project group under SJC, a volunteer youth organization for space enthusiasts between 18 and 35 years old. Uh, our project group focused on surprise uh, questions related to space and cybersecurity. And if you wish to join, become an advisor, or start a partnership with our group, uh, then please uh, email me, Thea Slam Detlefsen, or uh, Hannah Lindbergh, who are the co leads of this group, uh, at the email in the bottom of the screen. Uh, amongst other things, we will write papers for conferences and organize hackathons. As for uh, the voice is me, Thea Slam Detlefsen, who is one of the co organizers of this uh, webinar today. As for today, we are excited to present our two speakers and cybersecurity experts, TJ Blunt and Ram Levy. First, we have TJ Blunt, who will give a talk on cybersecurity and space law. Dr. TJ Blunt is a postdoc at the University of Luxembourg, where his teachings include space security law, international telecommunication law, cyber law, and much more. Previously, he has worked for many different universities including the University of Mississippi School of Law, Beijing Institute of Technology, and Montclair State University. He has also recently published the book Reprogramming the World, Cyberspace, and the Geography of Global Order. So thank you for joining us today. And uh, I will now give the screen to you today. Uh... <laughs> All right. Can you hear me now? And hold on. Oh, is my screen visible? All right. So let me um, figure out how to put this on to present mode. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today is cybersecurity and space law. Um, so first, let me tell you who I am. The uh, Tia already told you that, but I actually have That's recently nice. had a change in my um, position, and I'm currently a research fellow in cybersecurity governance and regulation at um, SES slash the University of Luxembourg. So like a, a joint appointment. Um, and I would have to, the reason I'm telling you this is because I need to tell you that um, this research is made possible by an industrial fellowship from Luxembourg's Fonds National Digital yeah. Research. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is where cybersecurity and space law intersect. Um, and the focus here is really going to be on commercial actors rather than on state actors, but there's going to be a lot of overlap in this. So let's start with space law. Space law doesn't really say anything about cybersecurity at all. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that the treaty regime really predated the concept of cybersecurity. Um, and it, it's made it into some national policies. Uh, so if you go look at the, the UK space policy, they actually talk about cybersecurity in it. But it's not been addressed formally in domestic legal regimes, which shouldn't be terribly surprising because cybersecurity itself doesn't make it into um, formal regimes a lot. It's, it's something that's slowly bubbling up into that. Um, the other important thing to remember about space law is that it's addressed to states. They're the subjects of it. It's a, a, a international law. Um, and the second thing is that it's addressed to space objects, right? That's really the thing that it's regulating. Um, one of the, the, the sort of the misconceptions is that space law governs space. It really governs space objects in space. So cybersecurity doesn't also doesn't say much about space, right? Um, there are a few standards out there, but there's nothing comprehensive. And a lot of those standards have to do more with uh, data transmission and data portability, right? Cybersecurity, though, is addressed at digital systems and processes, both the hardware and the software, um, and, and really a lot of other things, depending on your definition of cybersecurity. So one of the things that um, I, I talk about a lot is that, that cybersecurity, what it means changes depending on who you talk to. Um, and that's a, an, an interesting thing to think about when we, we think about how ubiquitous cybersecurity is as a concept sort of out there. Um, the fact that it has sort of no standard definition um, is, is something to think about. Um, 
the other thing that I want to kind of say here is where do cybersecurity rules come from, right? When we're talking about space law, the rules very much come from, from law, from legal regimes. Well, cybersecurity rules do come from law and regulation, but we also find them coming from policy. We have them coming from technical standards. We have them coming from what we call good practices. Um, sometimes you hear the phrase best practices. That one's falling out of favor and we're moving to good practices. And and then often the rules come from the code itself, how the, the, the code that underlies the programs that we're running and the hardware that we're using um, changes our ability to, to do things and not do things. So here's the premise here. If space law is addressed at space objects and cybersecurity is addressed at networks and systems, um, then these two regimes intersect to the extent that a satellite system functions or is capable of functioning on a digital network um, using an onboard computer, right? So um, the thing that I like to tell people when, when we're thinking about cyberspace and we're thinking about cybersecurity is that it is everywhere now, right? If you can digitally connect something, you're in cyberspace and now cybersecurity is a concern for you. Um, and satellites themselves are things that we can connect. They can be IP enabled. Um, and if you are, are savvy, you can hack into one, right? It's the, the, you know, the same as, as the wire that you're wearing on your wrist or, or you know anything else my my favorite is as I was in a, a, a bed bath and beyond a big store in the US and and the the salesperson was trying to, to sell me on a, a networked blender and I just couldn't pause I couldn't fathom what you one would do with a networked blender but I'll leave that there so Let's talk about liability real quick, because I think that a lot of the intersection for the commercial actor in space comes at the liability level, right? And, and a, a few things to remember about the space law regime. Under liability in, in the international space law regime, the nation might be on the hook for damage a space actor causes. Um, and this is sort of the effect of, of, of the Outer Space Treaty, which makes states responsible for the activities of their non-state actors. Um, but also under the, the Liability Convention, which makes launching states liable for damage that's done. Um, and I want to focus here on, on damage that's caused not on the surface of the earth because that's a, a strict liability regime and i want to i want to focus on space right so when damage occurs to an object in space then liability is fault based right um what is fault right well fault is the idea that somebody has done something wrong um so let's look at this example a cyber attack takes over the command and control of communications satellite A um, in the geosynchronous orbit. The attacker then uses satellite A to collide with and incapacitate satellite B, right? Is the owner or the, the state um, of satellite A liable for the collision? Has there been fault there? Um, and the fact that, that I would say that there's been a, a, a breach of the cybersecurity there is not necessarily indicative of fault, right? So the answer really is, and this is a, a good solid lawyer answer, it depends, right? And it depends on a lot of things. So fault is based on what a reasonable, prudent satellite operator would do, right? What would a reasonable person do in, these, in this situation, right? So really, we begin to have to ask this question, right? Did the owner of satellite company A, did they employ state-of-the-art information security protections applicable to critical infrastructure? Or maybe they employed security standards for an IoT device, and, and between those two questions, right, that's where fault might lie, right? Um, if you are using state-of-the-art information security protections um, and, and you're treating your satellite in geosynchronous orbit as if it is um, critical infrastructure and you have documented evidence that you're doing this, you might not be at fault for this cyber attack. However, if you've treated your highly valuable geosynchronous orbit satellite um, like it's a networked blender, you might be more likely to be at fault because you haven't done the things that a reasonable, prudent satellite operator would do to secure their operations, right? So the, the interplay of cybersecurity and space law is the extent to which a, a space player employs the requisite amount of security based on the risk to the system. So let's kind of unpack a little bit what that means. And I've got to tell you right now, I'm realizing that that I've, I've put together too short of a presentation, so you might get extra Q&A time. Um, so uh, cybersecurity, right? One thing to 
remember is that you are never cyber secure. Your system is never secure, right? There are always entry holes. There are always ways in, and there are, are people that are looking for them, right? Your system can be resilient, though, um, and resilience means that you have the ability to weather attacks and that you have the, the ability to counter attacks and to mitigate attacks when they happen, though. Um, so, so security, the absolute security, is really unattainable unless you, you know, take your satellite, put it in a box, put it at the bottom of the ocean, and and you know, at that point, it's sort of a non sequitur or a, a, a non-issue because it's not doing what you need it to do, right? Um, so, cybersecurity is about risk mitigation, right? You need to adopt cybersecurity plans that answer to risk risk mitigation, right? So this means that you need to assess the threats that are possible um, against you, and you need to look at the cost of mitigating those threats, right? So let's say you have a satellite up there and you think that somebody might be able to hack in and steal the remote sensing data that, that you have on board the satellite, but not get into the command and control system. Right. Well, this is a lower threat than if you think that there could be a breach of the command and control system, because the command and control system allows somebody to actually take over your satellite and change what it's doing. Whereas if they're just exfiltrating the, the data, your risks are lower there. Right. So uh, I think that the, the good example of this is right. A university CubeSat, right, something in very low Earth orbit that's non maneuverable, that's doing basic experimentation, um, really requires requires a different level of cybersecurity um, than a geosat with a secure communications capability, right? Um, a geosat is, is telecommunications infrastructure. If you have the ability to route encrypted communications through it, right, you're, you, you have the ability to function as a government asset at, at, at times when they need secure communications, right? So you are going to want to, to um, use more cybersecurity protections for that satellite than you would for the cube satellite, right? So the first step really is assessing the risks and the threats against you and then figuring out how you're going to mitigate those, taking into account, right, the, the, the value of the data and the value of the information system and, and the resources that you have to put towards that, right? The other thing to remember is the more complex your system, the less resilient it is. Um, and the, the example that I like to, to use is um, if you're in a room with one door, you are more secure than if you're in a room with a door and a window, right? That window adds a bit of complexity and it makes you less secure because you now have two entry points that you have to, to look at, right? Now, if your room has two doors and a window, right, you've gotten more, more complicated, right? So, so that is uh, the, the complexity here reduces your resilience. And so when you are assessing the risks that you face, um, you have to, to think about the complexity of the system that you've put into place and how you're going to, you know, one of the things when, when we're thinking about satellites, and I, and I assume that, that um, the next speaker is actually going to get more into to the technical end of this, right, is, is you have a, a lot of different things going, out, going on, right? You have... Um, a pathway for command and control going up to the satellite, but you also probably have a, an, an uplink and a downlink for data for just, um, you know, if it's a remote sensing satellite, let's take Landsat, for example, right? Landsat has a, a, a command and control link, but if you, if you have a ground station, anyone can pick up Landsat data that's being beamed down, right? So um, that is a lot more open. Now the question is, are those two systems connected on the satellite? Um, could somebody use the, the downlink for the remote sensing data to get in and across over to command and control? And that's a complexity question. So the other thing to remember here is that space is a strategic domain, right? Um, so some satellites likely qualify as critical infrastructure, right? So this is what I was talking about, and I'm going to kind of focus on the commercial actor, right? Because that is the big question right now, I think, for commercial actors is how do we maintain a level, a requisite level of cybersecurity? Um, but if, if you have a satellite that is critical infrastructure and you're functioning in a strategic domain, cyber, cyber attacks and cyber threats to your satellite might have national security implications. Um, and that's where this, this overlap comes, right? Because suddenly we have to think about your satellite in terms of how it might affect national security. Um, and, and a lot of that, again, goes back to what kind of satellite you are running. If you have a non-maneuverable uh, CubeSat, very likely you're not going to affect national security. Um, if you have a highly maneuverable satellite in low Earth orbit or medium Earth orbit, 
there's a good chance that that you might need to be more cyber secure um, because of the fact that your satellite, um, if it is is secured weakly, could cause a national security incident, right? So these national security uh, implications feed into that risk assessment and that risk management um, uh, idea that you, you you need to go for when putting this together. So. When you're assessing your cybersecurity risks, this has to be taken into account. Um, some, some satellites are more likely to be targets of entities that are looking to disrupt national security objectives of another state. So, how do you show that you're cyber secure? Um, and this is sort of a lot of the, the, the work that I'm doing now, right? Uh, my past cybersecurity work has been a lot more theoretical. I'm, I'm now sort of in the, the nuts and bolts world of, of how do you show that, that you are cyber secure? Cyber secure. Um, and cybersecurity from an enterprise perspective is very much about compliance, right? Um, you have to comply with laws, regulations, and policies. Um, and these are often general and usually are concerned with individual data, right? We don't have a lot of laws that say this is how you do cybersecurity. And one of the reasons for that is the, the same reason that the, the Outer Space Treaty doesn't say anything about um, remote sensing or resource extraction or, or you know all of these different technologies. It is because um, the, 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 when you're regulating on technology, if you put down specific technological standards and you know say that, that cybersecurity is going to require this type of encryption, right? Well, two months later, two days later, um, all of that can change because technology advances really quickly. So a lot of the time, um, laws and regulations tend to back away to general principles because it makes it easier um, for for specific technical standards to promulgate at lower levels and those lower levels are much more adept at adapting those quickly right and so I've given a couple of examples there of the ones that have to do with individual data the the first one is the the HIPAA regulation in the US GDPR we've all heard of that and have to click away the cookie message every now um, and and the the CCPA which is the new one in California the next thing is that you can show that you are compliant with industry standards, right? And these are technical standards that talk about how to do cybersecurity. And, and I think two that are worth raising here is the, the um, National Institute of Standards and Technology Framework um, for Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity, um, and then the ISO EIC 2700 fam family of, um, of standards, and in particular um, 27001, which talks about how to set up um, an information security management system. Um, and, and just to kind of talk about these two a little bit, if you go and read these right now, you, you aren't going to find in those, you know, the way to be cyber secure is encrypt this and don't encrypt this and use a firewall here. And it's these aren't technical things, actually. Um, these are things that tell you how to do compliance, right? Um, you need to make sure that this data is secure. So you have to, to check these boxes that you are doing that in one in, in some way shape or form because each enterprise and each company might choose different technical um, implementations of security but the idea that underlies cybersecurity is that you are paying attention and making sure that each step of the way you're paying attention to cybersecurity right um, now there aren't a, a ton of space of space specific cybersecurity standards um, as I've already said um, but some industry and government initiatives are underway to develop these um, but this is one of the problems that space has, has sort of faced is that it, it used to be really difficult to, to, to kind of cyber attack a satellite, right? Um, you could jam and you could spoof, but actually affecting the command and control of a satellite was seen to be, you know, tough. And satellites were, were physically remote. And so as a result, we didn't protect them in this way. Um, and we didn't really think that we had to. And suddenly um, we're recognizing that cybersecurity threats are everywhere um, and that space is not immune from that. And so the space industry is sort of playing catch up right now and trying to figure out how to do this. Um, and compliance, and I think this is really important, is both technical and legal, right? Um, you, you have to have a written policy describing how you are complying with these different laws and these different standards. Um, and, and I mean, I was actually in a meeting today where somebody said, well, you know, that we are doing that, you know, we, we're doing the cybersecurity thing. And somebody goes, if you can't show it, 
you, you don't have it, right? Just because you're doing it doesn't count. You need to be able to show that you have policies in place that do this. But those policies then have to be backed up with actual technical implementation. Um, I was I was reading the other day about a company that had gone for ISO certification um, and the, the ISO 2701 certification is sort of the gold standard for, for information security now. Um, and they had a, a wonderful set of policies, but when people, when the auditors began to interview the, the, the people, um, the people didn't know the policies, right? So there was no technical impl implementation. And, and you have to have that on both sides, right? Cybersecurity is both being technically secure, but being able to show how and why you are doing it. Um, and so the, the goal here, what you're trying to get out of all of this, is to show that you were reasonably secure um, in the case of a breach, right? That you were a reasonably secure um, space operator in case of a breach, breach right? But here's the problem, right? I keep using this idea of, of a reasonably prudent cyber operator. That's a it's a legal term, um, and and in common law world, in the common law world, we get cases, right? And we get case after case after case where we slowly build up what this idea of a reasonable prudent X is, right? Um, so if it's just tort law, it's a reasonable prudent individual. If you're a mining company, it's a reasonable prudent mining company. And we have practice over time that shows us what reasonable prudent mining companies do in certain situations. So we can identify when one has not done this, right? We don't have this in the space world. We are right now, I think, very unclear about what a reasonable, prudent space actor is. And I think there's a lot of, and, and I think that that reasonable, prudent space actor doesn't just apply to, to space security. I think we're having a lot of conversations about that right now, um, based on debris mitigation and end of life. And and you know, if you're looking at the mega constellations, what is a reasonable, prudent space operator um, when it comes to mega constellations? But cybersecurity plays into that and we don't have a, a the background now to know what how secure is secure enough um how do i know that i've been doing enough to protect my satellites um is a very difficult thing to, to put your hand on right now and the best that you've got is sort of um these 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 laws and these standards and these these good practices that aren't necessarily applicable to the space world specifically um now Hopefully, as we move forward, we will be getting more of that, and we will be having a better idea of what all that is, uh, or, or what constitutes a reasonably prudent actor. But but right now, um, it's a little hard to put your finger on, and so I think everybody's kind of muddling through. So let me give you other resources here, which is actually a, a, just a shameless plug. Um, uh, so I wrote an article um, in 2017, which is titled, Satellite is Just a Thing on the Internet of Things. Um, and it kind of goes into this idea of um, if you're a space actor, this is why you need to be concerned about um, cybersecurity. And, and where this title comes from is I was sitting in a meeting several years ago, and I made the offhand content comment that, you know, hey, you can fly a satellite with an iPhone now if you want to. And somebody else in the room goes, no, 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 they're supposed to crypt it up link and this and that and this. And somebody at the other end of the room goes, no, no, I did it two days ago. And so satellites, in, in a sense, are just more connected devices, and we have to, to figure out um, how to secure them, right? The other thing that I'd point you to is, is what Tia mentioned, um, my recent book, which actually isn't about cybersecurity in the space regime at all. Um, it's really about how cyberspace is is changing the way that we think about international and global governance. Um, and, and I'm happy to say that this is available open access. If you Google that, you can download it for free. Um, if you buy a copy, it's wonderful. I don't get a dime from it. Um, so go ahead and download it for free. And then I, if you have questions, feel free to email me or you can find me on Twitter at Blunt's Folly. And that's me. Thanks a lot to TJ for a great presentation and a brilliant overview uh, over uh, the links between uh, cybersecurity and, and space there as well. Uh, I think this is uh, very interesting and also something that we can use for our uh, project app stuff that we are working on for the IOC. Uh, I will also use this moment to ask if there's anybody who has any questions. Um, then, yeah, you can either write them in the... Hi, Tia. 
It's a bit difficult to hear you. I don't know if it's only me. Yeah, I, I think it's better now. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, I was uh, just thanking CJ for uh, his great presentation, which uh, provided a great overview of uh, space and cyber security and its links with uh, space law, which is also something that uh, our project group will benefit very much from um, in uh, relation to writing our abstracts for the IAC. Uh, I see that people are not hearing me very well. And I see a lot of thank you, TJ. Is there anybody who has any questions? For TJ? Okay. If not, uh, we can go uh, forward to, uh, to Ram Lobby if uh, everybody is. Um, Is ready for that. Hi. So, do you hear me? Or do you hear me, uh, everybody? Uh, I can, yeah. Okay. So, if I give a short presentation to Ram Lobby, he will give a talk on cyber security and space assets. Uh, Ram Lobby is the founder and CEO of Computer, a leading Israeli cyber security company. He is a cyber security expert and an advisor for global organizations with extensive knowledge on policy, technology, and hands-on experience. Ram served as the Secretary for the PM of the Israeli National Cyber Initiative and is currently the Cyber Advisor to the National Council for um, R&D and Senior Fellows at Tel Aviv. Thank you, Ram. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes, very well. Thank you. Great. The airport yes. are doing a wonderful job. Uh, I would just like to add a few things about myself. Um, I've been around the area of cybersecurity, I think, in the last 20 years uh, when I was serving in the Israeli intelligence. I was recently appointed the uh, cybersecurity advisor for the International Union of Aerospace Insurers. This is the union of all the companies that are insured, reinsured, and, and dealing with claims uh, around space. Uh, launching of space assets, uh, uh, um, uh, airports, and of course, uh, aviation companies and airlines. Uh, as part of my experience, I've been the secretary for the prime ministers of Israel, National Cyber Initiative. This was the task force that uh, laid the foundation for the Israeli leadership in cyberspace. Um, and I also uh, delivered uh, cybersecurity corner on I-24 News. And I wrote a thesis on cyber attack of space systems uh, back in 2013. And if you ask me, my biggest personal achievement, other than being uh, an ISU, International Space University alumni, is that I won the IDF cooking context back in 2007. Uh, and this is, this is me in the photo. Uh, I run a company now, which is a, a cybersecurity company. We help uh, global companies uh, align their cybersecurity efforts uh, basically to regulation and to the threat profile that we devise for them. Uh, so a lot of the things that I'm going to tell you are based on the experience and what we actually see with our own eyes and the difficulties and the struggles that those organizations have uh, in dealing with the complex issues of uh, defending themselves from uh, potential adversaries. Uh, there isn't a lot of need to explain to you why uh, in the internet is so important and all the great things that uh, telecommunications brought to us, uh, but it did not come without a price. And I think one of the first important things to note uh, when we talk about cyber risk, uh, that it's a risk that is coming from an adversary. And this is very important because it means that there is actually someone out there um, that can be in any part of the world without any probably limitation of geography that can operate at the speed of light and can create uh, some kind of a damage, uh, whether it's for uh, financial purposes, economic purposes, uh, activism, socialism, uh, um, to negate some kind, of, some kind of a system. And space is specifically vulnerable because the way it's built. And if you look at the, uh, at, at the US national cybersecurity strategy, 
that was uh, released a couple of a uh, couple of years ago there are two areas that are of specific concern to the americans and this is important because areas that are of specific concern to the americans will probably be dealt with um, in a very rigorous way the first one is maritime and i believe that this has become an issue because of the attack uh, that's that ha that started uh, in ukraine and propagated to uh, more than two dozen uh, multinational com companies, including AP Muller Maersk, which is the largest shipping company in the world, and halted the company's operations for more than 10 days. The other one, uh, the attack of North Petya, and I hope that if we have enough time, I'll discuss that as well. But the other one is space. And as you can see, uh, the answer to why space, why improving cybersecurity in space is important, and that is because the United States considered the unfettered access to the freedom to, in, to operate in space is vital to advancing the security, economic prosperity, and some scientific knowledge to the nation. And it's true. We actually see more and more uh, growing threats to space assets. And in the next couple of slides, I'll try uh, to explain why. Um, but before I begin, I'd like to give you my bottom lines. Um, my bottom lines are this. First, uh, cyber attacks unlike kinetic attacks, electromagnetic attacks, are attacks that enable adversaries to achieve strategic results without paying a strategic price. What it means is that you can actually negate a satellite service without negating the satellite itself. It's reversible, but highly deniable. And that's one of the biggest advantages that cyber, cyber attacks give us, the, the ability to make the attacks deniable. For many reasons, um, the uh, almost inability to to conduct uh, global law enforcement operations, uh, the very low motivation of nations to reveal their intelligence, even if they know who's behind attacks. And that gives uh, a very interesting uh, opportunity for adversaries to conduct attacks, which are actually almost cost-free, because if there is no enforcement and there is no punishment, uh, they can, you, you can actually do whatever you want and you will not pay a price for it. When it comes to strategic assets like space, it becomes even more important. Now, uh, until, we, until we were discussing cyber, we would usually look at a satellite and try to uh, defend the satellite itself. But I argue that when it comes to cyberspace, it's not enough to look at the, cyber, at the satellite itself because attacking a satellite is hard. But if you look from a service perspective, then there are many, many different different and new opportunities to actually attack the system, the components of the system, and achieve the same result. This is why we need to change the focus from protecting satellites to protecting satellite systems, the entire system as a whole, from the ground station, that the uplinks to the ground stations that receive the downlinks, uh, including the supply chain, uh, and all the service providers around those ground stations, and of course, the satellite manufacturers and the launchers themselves. Here's where the problem lies. Uh, the biggest motivation for in investing in cybersecurity, uh, and, and I haven't seen any information that can actually um, refute what I'm about to tell you, is regulation. When there's regulation, when there's proper regulation, when banks, for example, are being told what to do by the inspector general of the banks, or when insurance companies are being told what to do by the uh, by, by the securities committee and so on and so forth, then they will act and they will start invest, investing in security. For some odd reason, the space industry has been left behind. The regulation around uh, the space industry has not been developed enough to drive the satellite operators and the satellite manufacturers to do proper cybersecurity. This is where we're behind. So because cybersecurity is slowly becoming an enabler for innovation because of the commercialization of space, I argue that the next step should be to standardize, regulate, and to create a culture of security, of cybersecurity within the space industry, and it must start, start with uh, proper regulation. Now, uh, can, can you see this clip? Good. Uh, we tend to think that cyber attacks are a, a, a relatively new phenomenon, but they're actually not. They're almost as old as computers, and computers have been around since the 1960s. And in one of in a in a very interesting uh, movie that was uh, released a couple of years ago, uh, this is a story that very few people know. Uh, the guy behind uh, that you see in the back to us is Julian Assange, which you know from WikiLeaks, and this is his mother. They live 
in Australia. And uh, the setting takes place in 1987. And if you remember the Challenger, the shallow Challenger exploded in 1986. And NASA wants to launch a plutonium into a plutonium, um, a plutonium uh, based satellite to space. And they're afraid that if the satellite will, I mean, if the launch will explode, then that will create a, a nuclear disaster. Of course, that is not true, but fake news existed also in 1987. And I'd like to take a few, about a minute and a half to show you this clip and what happened. Okay, so there is no sound. I'll just give you the uh, what's going on. This is Melbourne police, and what he's doing, Julian Assange, he's attacking NASA uh, with a worm, a worm called Wank. And if you Google that, this is the first worm that we know. And Mendax is his nickname. And what he did is he shot down NASA. Here, what you see is the um, uh, Melbourne forensics police trying to understand who is behind the attack. All right, so the purpose of this clip was uh, to show you that um, uh, cyber attacks are almost as old as computers are. But what has changed is that uh, our notion of how the adversaries look like, look like have changed. Adversaries do not look like this anymore and money doesn't look like that. Uh, it looks like everything is now flowing in bits and bytes. Criminals are hard to, are hard to, uh, uh, to, to understand. They don't, we don't see them anymore. They might look like this, or in the newest version, they might look like this. And basically, what we are we are in a situation that uh, we are now running behind the evil forces that are trying to take control of the vulnerabilities and the good things that cyberspace has gave us. And the problem is, is that, as Michael Rogers said, that conflict in the cyber domain is not simply a continuation of kinetic operation by digital media. It, it's unfolding according to its own logic, which we are continuing to better understand. This means that um, for us as experts, uh, the, this is a true challenge to understand the new uh, phenomena uh, that we see right now, that adversaries are attacking and are creating damages and we need to help us understand, help com com companies understand what to do. Now, where is the problem? As I mentioned before, the first problem is, is that we have to understand that companies are in the front line of cyber attacks. Now, the companies are basically, they have to do defense with their hands tied behind their backs. Why? Because they cannot hack back. They cannot apply any force because this is the role of the government. And at the same time, the adversaries that are attacking them uh, are doing three things to make their life very, very hard. The first thing that they do is they put the time to know what is actually in the, in the networks that the, that the defenders need to protect. Now, if you ask any chief information security officer in the world one question, do you know what you're defending? I will be very surprised if the answer will be yes. The networks are so complex and the threat landscape changes almost on a, on a daily basis that it's almost impossible to know what you're protecting, which leads to the other question. If you don't know what you're protecting, how do you protect it? And the question, the answer to this question is most of the time, it's not. And that is because, and this is the second bullet, the adversaries, they put the time to know the network that the defenders have to protect better than those who are trying to design it and better than the people who are trying to secure it. So if you really want to protect your network, the first thing you need to do 
is to know your network. And this comes from a lecture given by Rob Joyce, who then became the cybersecurity advisor for the National, uh, National, um, National Security Committee at the White House. And before that, he was the head of the Tailored Access Operation at the NSA. Uh, his lecture is available in the link below. And I urge you to listen to it because this is one of the best lectures you'll ever hear about how adversaries think. Now, the problem gets even more complex because in every computer, there are software, and in every software, there are vulnerabilities. Now, vulnerabilities are weaknesses uh, in the IT system or the hardware that can be taken advantage of in order to trigger some kind of a threat. Now, when I say can be taken advantage of, that means that someone can either deny, deny the software from running, someone can take control of your computer because of the software vulnerabilities. And if you look at the amount of vulnerabilities that we have over time, and this is only the vulnerabilities that we are aware of and that we know, uh, we are talking about almost 17,000 vulnerabilities every year. And out of that, about one fourth are high vulnerabilities, which means High vulnerability is usually a vulnerability that can be used to take control of a device without any, any interaction from the user, and usually it can be done remotely. So if you take the number of new high risk every year, that means that every single week, every chief information security officer in the world has to deal with, about, with millions of risks, high risk every single week that are changing all the time. This creates a problem, a management problem that is almost impossible to fix. And if you add to that, that most defenders do not understand the attackers because they've never sat in their place, uh, we are in a situation where uh, it's very, very hard uh, to recreate proper defense. And of course, there are more examples of, uh, of attacking satellites. Uh, two of them were given by my colleague before, but I'll add you one more. Uh, and this was an official recognition by uh, ESA a few years ago. And in 1998, someone took control of the ground station operating uh, the German US Rosat satellite and, and, and changed the direction of the satellite uh, towards the sun and damaged the, uh, and created irreversible damage to the optical sensor. This is one of the few examples that we have of a physical attack of a satellite, which then remained in space for, I think, about 20 years uh, without any ability to do something with the satellite except being uh, in orbit. You will not be able to hear that, but I will tell you what you see in this movie. Uh, Edward Snowden, a couple of years ago, uh, has released information regarding the abilities of the DCHQ and the types of information that they are uh, that they are taking from satellite ground station. And in this clip, which is available online, uh, a Der Spiegel uh, journalist uh, came to a ground station called Stellar Communications in Germany. And he showed them the uh, amount of information, very detailed and intimate information regarding the network architecture of the, of the ground station. Uh, and I'll just, because you cannot hear the sound, I just wanted to see the looks on their faces when he shows them how intimate he was uh, within the ground station. This is the document here, the, tel the satellite teleport. And he was explaining to them uh, what they know. So the first thing he's showing to them, of course, is the map of the networks of the ground station. That's what adversaries do. They, have, they do reconnaissance. They collect information so they know what they're attacking. And as you can see, they're telling him. It's well documented. They know the network probably better than they do. Here they're discussing uh, the type of credentials that they have. You see, they know most of the routers. This is the really deep into the network. And here they are between the clients and the ground station, which means that they are in a, in a place where they can actually understand and listen and eavesdrop to every communication that is coming from and to the ground station. And of course, all the engineers and their credentials. What I'm trying to say, this is not theoretical. Uh, attacks against ground stations and satellite systems are happening all the time. Uh, of course, most of them we don't hear about. And I argue that the reason that we don't hear about them, it's not because it doesn't happen, it's because the motivation of, because the, motivation of the hackers is usually criminal motivation. 99% of the attacks are for criminal motivation. And there is very, very low criminal motivation in attacking satellite systems. 
There are other easier targets to make money. But uh, if we uh, jump into the theory for just a second, uh, if we uh, zoom out and we look at the um, at, at, at the space system rather than a satellite, then we can apply a theory called the theory of system transformation, which can help us understand how we can uh, kill, quote unquote, a satellite system without attacking the satellite itself. And the way it works is this. The theory says this, in order to get a system to collapse, you only have to eliminate only partial uh, amount of nodes in the system. And a partial amount of nodes is this, 10% of the systems of the nodes and you get a probability of 50% that the system will collapse without prior knowledge. And if you can reach 50% of the system, then 100% probability that the system will collapse. Now we've seen that in many cases, for example, the case of NotPetya, uh, where, this, where, where it was a destructive worm that deleted millions of computers around the world. Millions of computers mean that you're actually transforming a computer from an alive state to a dead state, and therefore the organization collapsed until they can reinstall the software again. Uh, and if you look at the human body, this is an example. The human body has about uh, almost more than uh, 1,000 org organs. And if you target just the brain, that means that you have intelligence, which is, if you can compare it to a satellite system, it can be the satellite. Then only by attacking the brain, you can transform the entire, the entire body from a state of alive to a state of dead. But if you don't have any knowledge, but you only know that there are some components in the body which you can transform from alive to dead, then if you just uh, uh, remove 50% of the body, let's say you take the fingers and the eyes and some hair and then parts of the leg, then at some point, which we know it's much less than 50%, the body will not be able to withstand the pain and the system will collapse. How do we apply it to a satellite system? We zoom out and we take into account the components that build this, the ground station, including the satellite itself, meaning the antennas and the PLCs that are controlling the antennas and the computers that are used to do the invoicing for the ground station and the supply chain and the employees and the workers and their phone. And if we, and if we start attacking them, targeting just them with the easiest tools that we can find, if we attack 50% of them in concert and at the same time, then there's a 100% chance that the ground station will, not, will just not be able to function. And if the ground station will not be able to function, this will lead to the result that the satellite will not be able to provide the service because the ground station doesn't, doesn't function. That's the theory. I promised to discuss NotPetya and I'll, I'll discuss that in, uh, in a few words. Uh, in 2017, um, uh, a, a worm, a destructive worm, uh, started propagating uh, from Ukraine uh, to companies that stay that that operated from Ukraine uh, to uh, um, to about 100 and something uh, 100 and something uh, countries in the world. What happened? Well, the story behind it is a it's almost a story that it's almost like a fairy tale. But the uh, Russian intelligence services uh, stole uh, attack tools from the NSA. Uh, the Russian intelligence services are called the Fancy Bear, and they stole those tools from a group called the Equation Group. It is believed that Equation Group is the NSA, and it is believed that the Fancy Bear is, um, is the Russians. What they did is they used the vulnerabilities in the attack tools and installed them uh, in an accounting software that is required by most companies that operate in Ukraine. And somewhere in uh, a few weeks before uh, June 2017, uh, an update to the software has been disseminated to all the clients that are using the software. And of course, the software came in uh, with the uh, attack tools that the Russians stole from the Americans. And the tool contained the worm uh, with the ability to do privilege escalation, meaning that you can get administrative control uh, in the network that you're in. And that allowed you to propagate with the vulnerability that existed in Windows from computer to computer. And in June 2017, uh, we saw this headline. This is the chief operating officer of AP Mulemers, which is the largest uh, shipping company in the world, saying, we found ourselves having to move 15% of global trade without any IT infrastructure. And as far as we know, and this is what Merck says, for 10 days, they had no IT. And in a global interconnected world, especially in the shipping world, where most of the cargo and most of the uh, everything around the shipping industry is digitalized, 
you can hardly do anything without computers and the company uh, declared a loss of about 300 million dollars uh, those are the big names uh, that were attacked as well uh, Ape, uh, Merck, which is uh, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies, has declared a, a loss of 1.3 billion dollars. Uh, TNT Express, uh, which is which was bought by FedEx, has declared a loss of about 400 million dollars. And here are the numbers. Um, this is this comes from the aviation industry, and as you can see, 56 was the TNT Express integration expenses into FedEx, and then 257 million expenses in the nine months after 2019. That's the cost of recovering from a destructive cyber attack. When you look at the insurance aspect of it, uh, this was the largest, uh, the largest uh, attack in history in terms of loss, uh, 10 billion US dollars in loss. Only 3.3 .3 of it was insured. Now pay special notice because three of it was silently insured, meaning it was uh, a cyber risk that was within a property policy, which is not a standalone cyber insurance policy. Only 3% was a standalone cyber insurance policy. And that led uh, to a change in the structure of the uh, insurance industry. And in beginning 2020, you cannot buy a silent cover, meaning a property or risk cover. And if you want to cover, for example, your space-based assets, you will need to, to buy an affirmative cyber cover, meaning an additional cost to cover you from cyber attack. Now, how do we know it's the Russians? Uh, we don't guess. We're not in the guessing game. Uh, this is a statement from uh, the White House in 2018, blaming the Russians um, directly, claiming that this was a reckless, indiscriminate cyber attack that will be met with international consequences. And of course, as we know, uh, there were very little consequences, mainly sanctions, which we don't believe will make a big difference in the ability to restrain adversaries. What does it mean? It means that uh, if, as I said before, if, if most attacks against um, uh, standard, the, I would say the civilian infrastructure is a criminal based and that can be easily insured, I think that attacks against space space assets uh, will be nation state, uh, originated by nation state. This is a big issue because it will be harder to find insurance coverage uh, for nation state attacks uh, against uh, space systems and this is something that we have to take into account. Uh, since we don't have a lot of time, I would just like to cover one more thing, and that is the uh, extensive GPS jamming that we're seeing recently. Um, this is a, an example of GPS jamming that we know that occur in the Middle East. Um, we know it from uh, three different sources. One is the Maritime Administration that admitted that there were um, GP ex extensive GPS jamming uh, in the areas in the Black Sea. Uh, very close to uh, Syria when you go down from Turkey towards uh, towards Lebanon, um, also in the Suez Canal and in the vicinity of, uh, of the coast of Saudi Arabia. Uh, we suspect that the Russians are doing that as well, and that is to prevent uh, the guided missiles from uh, having uh, uh, from uh, receiving the GPS signals. But it has a very interesting effect on two other industries uh, which we need to discuss. The first one, straightforward maritime. Uh, ships are using GPS to calculate their course over ground. And although it's not a safety issue, it's becoming an operational issue for those ships because it's very hard for them to calculate their true speed and therefore hit the entrance window to the ports uh, and arrive on time. And of course, save, co save um, the, the cost of fuel because the cost of fuel is uh, being uh, calculated based on the speed. But the second issue that we see is that uh, airplanes that are flying in that area as well, or at least some of them, especially those the private jets and the less qualified pilots, they which fly only on uh, on GPS, especially at night and in uh, very very tough conditions, they don't receive G GPS as well. And some of them, including the FAA, which recently issued an advisory, uh, see and say that this is a really life-threatening situation. And this is a very interesting case of a space-based system, which, is, which has become critical uh, for our daily life and is very, very hard uh, to defend uh, because of the, uh, and, and we see more and more threats because of the ge geopolitical tension. This is uh, zoom into uh, the reports of the vessels and the aircraft. And I can tell you for a fact that I've seen it with my own eyes, it does happen, it happens in Israel, it happens in the sea. I was sailing with some uh, uh, vessels outside of Israel, and it happens all the time. Uh, what does it mean? 
Uh, I, I would like to quote um, Albert Einstein that says, we cannot solve our problems uh, with the same thinking we use uh, when we created them. And when, it's, when it comes to cybersecurity, I would like to offer you four laws uh, which you can implement every time you approach a cybersecurity problem. First of all, cybersecurity is an art. It's not a science. Uh, I've been working with every type of organizations and what we do today, uh, we work with managements of the largest Israeli multinational companies and prepare them for cyber attack. Every company is different. They're different in culture, they're different in people, they're different in structure, they're different in their IT architecture, they're different in clients, they're just different. Therefore, their cybersecurity strategy, policy, um, procedures, people will be different. Therefore, it's an art, it's not a science. And you cannot follow a recipe. You can only follow, as my colleague said before, guidelines. I, I argue that the best guidelines do not come from international standards, uh, but they come from banking regulation. And the reason is, is because banking, banks were the first to, actually almost the first, to uh, understand that the threat is great. Banks depend on the trust of the people. And, and because for them, protecting the reputation, making sure that they're not attacked is of high concern and they're highly regulated and they know how to manage risk. The banks, especially the banks in the US, Israel and, and Europe have developed very, very good uh, cybersecurity regulation, which I recommend to follow because they're practical and they give you very, 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 very good insight of not only what should be done, but also what can be done because banks are negotiating their, uh, uh, their regulation with the regulators and therefore they achieve a better result. The second thing is what I've said in the beginning, you cannot say any, anything interesting or significant about a system or an environment or a company without the context of the particular application in the environment. This is critical. You cannot copy one, one, protection, um, one protection strategy from one organization to another one. It will just not work and it bounce to fail. The third one is about risk management. There's always a question of risk appetite and how much money you're willing to spend uh, to close your exposures. And there'll always be exposures and there'll always be competing uh, tensions between the need to achieve the market quickly, the time to market, uh, uh, the, the, the need to save costs, the need to change people. So you never spend more money eliminating the security risk than the one that you can expose. And, there's, and that's a question of exposure and risk management. And you are also the ability to transfer the risk to a third party, which is usually an insurance company. And the fourth, we have to keep in mind that uh, cyber risk is a man-made risk and cyber attacks are man-made attacks. When I say men, I mean men and women, I mean human-made risk and human-made attacks. And therefore, there are no technical solution to management problems. If management do not understand that there is an issue that needs to be solved, it will not be solved. But we can solve with proper management technical problems. This is what cybersecurity is all about. Solving, managing a problem that comes from technical issues uh, with management capabilities. Okay, um, thank you. Since you cannot hear, then uh, I will say thank you. This is my email. Feel free to contact me. And thank you for inviting me to this wonderful, this wonderful opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Um, so first, I just want to say thank you to Rami for a very good presentation, also to PJ Blanc. So this was the first webinar for the Space and Cybersecurity Project Group in SJAC. And I hope the first of many webinars. I don't think we have so much time left for questions, but we will share the presentations in the project group on our Slack site. Um, and I think that is all for today. So just a big thank you for the two presenters. It was very insightful. And I think that idea with our webinars is that our members, but also other people in the network has the chance to tune in and get a bit educated on the topic of space and cybersecurity and the project group is currently working on their first paper on three topics within this so thank you both and i will see you with tia if thank she can you connect. thank you i think she has some problems with the mic so i will thank also on her behalf thank you both and to so everybody who tuned in also thank you for listening
All right. Have a nice evening or day, depending bye on bye. where you are. Bye. <clears throat> this conference will now be recorded.